There we go. Okay. Um, well, so welcome uh, to our program this evening. Um, Native landscaping. Is it for the birds? Um, um, I'm actually, very... <laughs> this one is called um, uh, the Purpose Driven Landscape. Oh, is it the Purpose Driven Landscape? Okay. Well, that one I have down for August. That's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, we might have to redo August then. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> we can um, do that. So I, anyway, we're gonna... information about birds too. So. Okay, um, so we uh, um, so we'll be talking about um, native landscaping um, and you use utilizing native plants in your landscaping around your house. Um, and so just uh, if you guys can stay on mute through the program, if you have any questions at the end, you can feel free to unmute and ask Nan your questions. Yes, I love um, questions. <laughs> so um, Nan, I'm just going to give you give you a little information about Nan and then I'm going to let her take it away. Um, and I'm Carrie. I am the assistant director here at the Franklin Public Library. I always forget to introduce myself at these things. I'm horrible about that. So I just want to welcome you and thank you for being here tonight. Um, all right. Nan Calvert is the program manager for the Respect Our Waters program for Root Pike Watershed Initiative Network. In that position, she helps municipalities within the Root Pike watershed to fulfill their DNR permit requirements by providing education and information on stormwater runoff and water quality. She has had decades long love of native plants, both personally and professionally. Root Pike Wynn makes use of her expertise to help guide their multiple habitat restoration projects that directly impact fresh water in the Root Pike Basin. Her knowledge base comes in very handy with the Pollinator Patch Program as well. Nan lives on a little slice of heaven off Highway 11 with her husband, dogs, chickens, angora goats, horses, and fig trees. I'm going to come to your house, Nan, and pick some figs. <laughs> I love figs. All right. Thank you so much, Nan. And I'm go ahead and take it away. Oh, thanks. And I appreciate the two of you joining in tonight. Um, I hope I can give you information that you're looking for. So feel free to ask lots of questions. Um, I think Carrie would like to keep that at the end. Um, and so, yeah, so we will get started. Um, do you see the um, photo that I have up there are multiple plants on that photo? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So this is called the Purpose Driven Landscape. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about native plants and native landscaping, um, as opposed to uh, conventional horticultural plants uh, that we buy at our local nurseries. Uh, that's a whole different ball game. Uh, that's a whole different philosophy, um, and uh, my focus is purely native plants as well as edibles. Um, so I just wanted to show you that, that the, the use of native plants, the love of native plants, and native landscaping can be combined uh, with food crops as well. Um, and so if, um, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, that's one of our native violets um, and those are edible and they're beautiful. You can use them in lots of different things like jelly and you can sugar them and put them on cakes and whatnot. The one below it is called nodding wild onion. Yes, it tastes like onion and it smells like onion. Uh, the one below it is wild garlic. Um, and yes, it can be harvested and used just like garlic that we find in our grocery stores. Below that is hazelnut or filbert, and those are the ones we eat actually. Um, and if you can get to them before the chipmunks and the squirrels get there, you're pretty lucky. So plant lots of them so that you can share. The upper right hand corner is wild leek. Sometimes they're called ramps. Um, they smell and taste and, and look like um, very miniature versions of the leeks that you find in our supermarkets. Um, I'll get my face out of the way here. There we go. Um, below that, uh, right now they're just in full bloom. That's one of our native sumac species that has, happens to be staghorn sumac. Um, when 
those buds are blooming and they're quite large, as you might know, and colorful, they smell absolutely divine. They are extremely rich in vitamin C and you can make all kinds of things out of them, uh, like a lemonade-like drink. Um, you can use the seeds in cooking. Um, it's just a, a really wonderful nutritional plant. Lower right-hand corner, you'll soon be seeing these. That's elderberry, completely edible. What a beautiful plant in flower and also when it's in fruit. And in the middle there, the little white flower is wild strawberry. Uh, those are just a handful of things uh, that provide food for our wildlife species um, as well as humans. So what you need to know is that um, long before our libraries and houses and hospitals and farms were here, all of southeastern Wisconsin, and in fact, all of Wisconsin, uh, was covered in native plants. Uh, that changed drastically with the advent of Europeans who came here, uh, brought plants with them from the motherland, wherever that happened to be, uh, and uh, began farming and clearing the land for other things. Um, and, and so, you know, back then, we didn't realize, our ancestors didn't realize, our forebears and foremothers didn't realize what kind of an impact that would have. And so with the drastic loss of habitats filled with native plants, uh, we have also lost many, many other uh, species, insects, birds, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. Um, and we know now, of course, today that they're um, all in decline, not only because of habitat loss, uh, but also climate change, um, chemical use, um, and a whole host of other things. And what I would like people to understand is when they put their shovel into the soil, it comes with great power and great responsibility to do amazing good. Um, it also comes with the responsibility of realizing uh, that you can have far reaching negative impact when you put that shovel into the soil. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how you can do great good uh, by planting native plants uh, and what that means and why they are utterly essential um, at this point in time. Oops, sorry, backwards. Well, now I'll go. All right, so <clears throat> interestingly enough, I, I think it's changing a little bit. Um, I've been doing this for a long time but it's always shocking and disheartening to me to know that most people don't know what it means to be a native plant. We aren't taught this in school. Uh, you don't learn it unless you are intent on having a career in the environment uh, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, everybody else is kind of in the dark about it. Uh, so as I said, everywhere was covered with native plants at one point in time. And by plants, I mean grasses, sedges, flowering plants, which are the science word is a forb, trees, shrubs, mosses, plants that grow in water, plants that grow alongside water. They evolved in conjunction with the habitat. So in other words, they evolved along with the soil, the hydrology of the area, weather, and climate, as did all of the species that depend upon them. Uh, our native species are hardwired to recognize native plants as the things that they need in order to survive and thrive. So all of our native beings with whom we share the earth depend on them. Birds absolutely depend on native plants, and I'm gonna illustrate that in a minute for you. Mammals, insects, reptiles, amphibians, all of the microbiota uh, that, that uh, you know, we may or may not have learned about when we were in school. Uh, they're kind of the underpinning of, of life here on earth. I, I call native plants the intercessors between earth and sky. Um, and here's one of the reasons. So here's a native Wisconsin plant. It comes up in early March when there's still snow on the ground and it's very cold 
The soil has not warmed up yet. We're still wearing long underwear. And it's a really unique and unusual looking plant. And so that big fleshy part that you're looking at now comes up first, and that's called a spathe, S-P-A-T-H-E. And inside is something called a spadix. And that's, uh, that's where the um, nectar resides and, and uh, is very attractive uh, to lots of living things. Um, the interesting thing about this plant is that this is the flower, and that really is the color of the flower. And it comes up long before the big, vibrant, green, sort of fleshy looking leaves do. And this plant lives in low, wet woodlands in, in dappled light, very dark, mucky soil. Now you have to ask yourselves, why would a plant use up so much energy? It's an extravagant use of energy to have this very sizable bloom come up in the winter. Well, one of the reasons is, is that this is one of a few known plant species that actually makes its own heat. So inside that hood or spathe, it can be upwards of 30 degrees warmer than the ambient air temperature. And that's really important because there are what we call early emerging insects in the very early spring in March, and they need energy. And so they dart in and they nectar on that spadix uh, and they get warmed up because, you know, insects have to be a certain temperature in order for their muscles and their wings to work properly so they can fly. And, and once they've warmed up and they've eaten and their energy, you know, their carbohydrate stores are replaced, they go out and fly about again. So we have this extravagant expenditure of energy on the part of the flower. And then we also have these little insects that are out and about seemingly at the wrong time, but it isn't the wrong time. The reason they're out is because there are early returning migratory bird species coming in at this point and they need protein. All bird species essentially need protein. And so those little insects are out there, out and about, um, procreating, but also waiting for birds to feast on them. The birds have expended an enormous amount of energy. Their fat stores are very, very low. Uh, even their, uh, their breast muscles along their keel now, probably in many cases, have started to atrophy because it's been such a long journey. Uh, and they need to eat. So in a sense, you know, these plants are joining earth to sky by keeping um, birds and insects alive in, in the very, very early spring. Here's, here's another example of how native plants are purposeful. Uh, they're not just there as um, a, a yard ornament, if you will, like so many of our horticultural species are. So, oh, and by the way, the plant that we were just looking at, that's called skunk cabbage. Um, and uh, in, in um, Riverbend Nature Center in Racine has an amazing display of skunk cabbage in the springtime. They have a very low wet woodland there. And this plant also oftentimes grows right alongside marsh marigold, uh, another one of our beautiful spring wetland um, ephemeral plants. Uh, this one is a, is a summer plant. Uh, and it's very tall and it's very vibrant and it has leaves, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, that actually clasp the stem. It looks as if the stem has just perforated that leaf. And the cool thing about it is that it holds water like a cup. And in point of fact, it is called cup plant, C-U-P dash plant. And this is very important, especially in times like these when we've had a drought the morning dew can settle in these cups and things that are thirsty like birds and insects and frogs uh, can get a, a much needed drink of water. This is a very important bird species food. Uh, birds love these when they go to seed and they are prolific seed producers. So good protein, good fat energy for birds, especially the ones that are going to migrate to warmer climates and abundant food, cup plant. Another reason that native plants are so very purposeful is not only do they sustain the other living beings with whom we share the earth, 
but they are very conservative. Uh, they conserve soil like no other plant, actually. And that's because they have amazing, amazing root systems. Sometimes they go down 12 feet. Um, and so what happens is that when it rains um, or the snow melts, water can then travel along these highways created by native plants. And then the water goes back down underground into the underground aquifers where it's supposed to go. In point of fact, we aren't supposed to have this much sheet flow after rain and snow melt. We aren't supposed to have this much storm water runoff. In fact, before everything changed so drastically and we covered the earth with impervious surface, which to an extent also includes turf grass, only about a 4% of rainfall and snow melt uh, sheet flowed off into the nearest body of water. I just want to apologize. I live on a small farm and you may still hear a rooster occasionally. I don't know if you heard that just moments ago, uh, but they haven't gone in yet. So uh, that's why you might hear chicken sounds in the background. Um, so the other part of it is it holds on to soil. We know uh, that erosion is a terrible problem for our waterways in the root pipe watershed. Um, and that's because we have too much exposed soil and we have landscapes that don't hold on to the soil the way they're supposed to. Um, and you know our topsoil is disappearing uh, like crazy and has been doing so for a long time. These root systems then um, every year they die back to about 30% nourishes the soil. They grow back again every year. Um, and then of course we have this fabulous display above the soil surface that allows our native pollinators and, as, and our native birds uh, to, to survive quite handily. Um, native landscapes are, are exceptional for our native bird species uh, because of nectar. So if you wanna have hummingbirds, put in a native landscape, you'll have more hummingbirds than anybody else. And certainly uh, seeds uh, that the plants produce later on in the year and ground nesting birds, our native ground nesting birds, can take advantage of these landscapes to safely nest uh, and rear their young. Uh, here in the middle, we have turf grass. Uh, turf grass is a lot like carpeting the earth. Um, it doesn't really allow for any infiltration. And then, of course, you have to remember all of the things that we do to turf grass. Uh, like herbicides and pesticides and mowing it every time we turn around and watering it. Um, and yet, you know, you can't eat it. Um, it. It's not a food crop for much of anything at all. You can't wear it. You can't really make anything out of it. And yet we lavish um, all these resources on this thing that isn't life sustaining at all. And so, uh, we have to change our mindset on that. It's no, it hasn't been sustainable for a very long time and it certainly isn't sustainable now. Um, so here's a picture of everybody's favorite bird. Well, almost everybody's favorite bird. Um, that's a female ruby-throated hummingbird and she's nectaring on Lobelia cardinalis or uh, Cardinal Lobelia, red Cardinal Lobelia. Um, it's, it's redder than anything you've ever looked at, seriously. Um, it's uh, a bit of a picky plant. <laughs> it's not as easy to grow as so many other of our native plants, but it's worth it just to see it bloom every year. It does like wetter, richer soil, um, and uh, it can take full sun, but it also likes partial sun as well. Um, and um, it, it is a myth, of course, as you probably already know, that hummingbirds have to have red. They don't have to have red. There are dozens of species, native species upon which they nectar uh, that are yellow, white, pink. Uh, they're really going for the quality of nectar. Uh, and so what you should, what you need to know is that native plants produce nectar in higher quantity and of a much higher quality than non-native plants. So if, if you really wanna do something good for nectar feeders like hummingbirds, get some native species in there. And if you'd like a list of species that hummingbirds are really attracted to uh, that are natives, I would be happy to, to give you that uh, list. Um, 
So, so let's say you've decided, yeah, okay, I, I really want to put in some natives. I want to attract more birds. I want to support our native um, biotic community. So, so what do I do? Um, so here's one of the first uh, things that are that is different when you look at native landscaping versus conventional or horticultural landscaping. So when we do native landscaping, we choose the plant for the conditions. So often in horticultural landscaping, we try to change the conditions for a specific non-native plant. Um, and that's that generally it doesn't really work because you have to keep doing that. So we look at what the conditions are and we and we go through our exhaustive list of native plants and what will work there. It doesn't matter what kind of soil you have, we can find plants that will work there and that belong there. Remember, they were all over the place before uh, people changed everything. They can be all over the place again. They can dominate our landscape again. So <clears throat> the first thing we do is we assess your site. How much light does it have? Is it wet or is it dry or is it somewhere in between? What are the soil conditions? Do you have very light, well-drained soil? Is it you know, sort of gravelly and sandy? Uh, do you have something that is just right, uh, quote unquote, just right? Is it uh, loamy and light? Or do you have heavy soil? Do you have clay soil? And that's what a lot of landscapers do. They, you, know, you have clay soil, it's bad. We have to get rid of it. We have to change it. It's always going to be clay soil, no matter what you do. There are so many native plant species that either thrive in clay soil or they just don't care about clay soil one way or the other. Then you're going to be thinking about, you know, what are the goals for your landscape? Do you need it to be controlled and organized and manicured? Or do you want it to be native, but a little bit more natural looking, you know? Uh, do you want to have paths through it? Do you want to have uh, a place where you can go in and sit and write or do photography or draw or whatever it is? Um, do you want to attack, attract birds and butterflies? Um, and quite frankly, when you plant a native landscape, you're going to have a lot of native birds and butterflies that'll frequent it because they're hardwired to recognize it. It's in their DNA to recognize it. They know what they need. There are species that have adapted because they don't have any other choice. But we also know that many, many of our native species are declining because they can't adapt so well to all the non-native and invasive species uh, that are, are covering our neighborhoods and our cities and our countryside. Um, maybe you wanna put in a pollinator patch. Maybe you want to favor our native pollinators. Maybe you're really you're interested in recreating or reintroducing what was the original habitat and um, people do that. And, and there's an interesting, uh, very, very beautiful, interesting place, not too far from where I live. Um, it was owned by a number of generations of farmers um, and the most recent generation decided to quit fighting nature uh, and restore it to the wetland that it was. So now it's a big wetlands complex. And there are a lot of birding clubs that come out to look at uh, water birds and migratory birds. Um, it, it's a very popular place now, even though it's a, a private property. He gives them permission to come out. They don't just arrive, but. Um, so, okay, so you've decided what your goals are. Uh, and now what you have to do in order to get this accomplished to reintroduce or reestablish native landscaping is to prepare the site. So yes, you have to remove the existing non-native plants. And that means turf grass, uh, which is probably the dominant species that you have growing. Um, and there are a lot of methods for removing non-native plants, depending upon whether they are grasses or flowering plants or trees and shrubs, because you want to replace native trees and shrubs. Maybe you have lots of buckthorn, uh, and it's formed basically a, a monoculture. And of course, you're going to need to get rid of that. So there are, there are a lot of approaches to doing that. Um, but the best thing that you can do, the way to ensure success of your new native landscape 
is to prepare the slap site thoroughly. Take your time preparing it. Uh, be vigilant about getting rid of the stuff that doesn't and shouldn't be there. Uh, you have to remember all of the native plants that we have blanketed our landscapes with, their checks and balances have been left behind from wherever it is they originated, whether that was Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, all their checks and balances are still back there and they are not hindered by those here. Uh, our native plants still have all of their checks and balances. Uh, and so we have to give them a leg up by removing the things that outcompete them for important resources. If you take your time doing that and you do it thoroughly, you, I will guarantee you that you'll be successful at putting in your native landscape. Um, the most common methods of removal are chemical removal, which means that you're using um, herbicides um, in a very targeted and timely, careful approach. Uh, sometimes burning is also employed, but that's usually simply for really large areas. Um, smothering is a very effective method, and it's also uh, very economical, but you do have to be patient. Uh, so smothering means, uh, for example, if you want to get rid of lawn um, and you don't want to round it up, um, mow it down to within you know, a millimeter of its life. Then you put down brown paper. So that can be cardboard, it can be grocery bags, it can be rolls of brown paper that you can purchase through um, landscaping places or online. And then you cover that over with two or three inches of really good high quality double or triple ground wood mulch. Um, if you're planting native plants that come in small containers, you can plant right through that. Um, if you're going to seed that area, which many people do, uh, just, you know, you smother it out for a whole season. And don't get impatient. Uh, you know, let your neighbors know what you're doing so they don't think you've gone around the bend, um, but let, you, let them know what your intentions are um, and hopefully they'll follow along with you. But again, thorough and patient site preparation is the key. The first three years of any native landscape are the most critical because you have to make certain that non-natives and invasive species don't reestablish whilst your native landscape is establishing itself. But after about three years, what you're going to notice is that you have a very beautiful and vibrant, diverse landscape. The plants take a long time to, to establish those beautiful, long, effective functional root systems. Things will be going on above soil, it's true, uh, and that will get more and more as the years pass. So I want to tell you something that we have going on right now, and then I, I, I want to share some news with you that's just phenomenal to us. Um, a year or so ago, we started talking about the rusty patched bumblebee, um, because where our office is located um, is within the UW Parkside campus. Um, and the world-renowned cross-country course for UW Parkside um, is right behind our office, 210 acres of woodland, prairie, some wetland. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee um, is a critically endangered insect. Uh, it used to be very, very common in that area of Kenosha. Uh, unfortunately, since 1997, it has become exceedingly rare and in fact has declined over 87% um, in the last about 20 to 25 years. That's a, that's a precipitous decline for one species that used to be very common. Uh, the rusty patch bumblebee is one of our native pollinators. And when one pollinator begins to decline, the other pollinators begin to decline as well. So we started talking to UW Parkside um, and we are, we are well underway in the restoration phases of 
this 210 acre parcel and we're specifically um, restoring it to, to help reestablish the rusty patched bumblebee population. It will also support all of our native pollinators, but we're certainly including a lot of the species of flowering plants that the rusty patch bumblebee requires in order to uh, nest and rest and feed and breed, which is what birds require as well. Uh, we put in a pollinator patch uh, in front of our office uh, just this year, we're just finishing up. Um, and honest to goodness, we had just planted a couple of native plants called penstemon. And literally the intern that's working with us, she turned around to grab another plant and a bumblebee flew in and started nectaring on this plant. Um, it wasn't a rusty patched bumblebee, uh, but it was a relative of that bee. Uh, and so since then, uh, we've seen monarchs and hawk moths or glasswing moths and um, all kinds of pollinators, big and small, uh, come in to feast on the nectar uh, on our native plants. Um, so, so the reason that the rusty patch bumblebee and all of our pollinators is declining is habitat loss. Uh, so it's been paved over, built on, drained, um, turned into millions and millions and millions of acres of lawn uh, that doesn't support anything. We've replaced, you know, flowering plants in 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 our habitats with bulbs and the latest greatest hosta or whatever it might be, and they just don't have a purpose other than pleasing people. And we have to get out of that mode now. We have to uh, live as if everything matters. Um, climate change, of course, is an enormous contributor to species decline. Uh, you know, everything is off cycle, droughts, excessive heat, fires. Uh, and so what we talk about now in the native plant world, in the ecology world, is resilient landscapes. Uh, so we need to start putting in resilient landscapes to survive in ex extended heat, drought, flooding, uh, cold, um, and native plants are, are designed to survive, uh, partly because of their root system, uh, partly because if conditions aren't right, so often they'll just say, okay, I'm giving up for now, I'll be back later. Um, so. Of course, uh, habitat decline has um, also been impacted directly uh, through agricultural expansion, the use of herbicides and pesticides. Um, and we are working with local farmers uh, to help them understand the importance, uh, number one, of uh, cover cropping, and number two, planting native borders, pollinator borders, around their fields. Uh, it's important for flood control. It's also important for pollinator sus sustenance, uh, birds, everything. So we hear a lot about honeybees. Uh, honeybees are not native. Uh, they never have been native. They come from Europe and Africa um, and they make honey and that's wonderful. Um, I, I live in an area where you can't really shake a stick without hitting somebody who has bees on their property not at all worried about honeybees. I am worried about our native pollinators. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get people to care about our native pollinators uh, because they think of German yellow jackets <laughs> and they think about getting stung. But in point of fact, our native pollinators are not aggressive. They're not even nearly as aggressive as honeybees can be. And our native pollinators contribute more than $3 billion in fruit pollination annually. That's a lot. Uh, and when we're talking about climate change affecting human food supplies, uh, we have to start thinking about what enables the human food supplies, and that happens to be uh, our native pollinators. They're also obviously uh, vital to the survival of native ecosystems. Our native plants rely on them for pollination. Um, our birds rely not only on the plants for sustenance, but they also consume our native pollinators and that's okay. It was designed to be like that. There's supposed to be a balance. Um, uh, so it all, it all works together. 
So, so what's the solution? Well, the solution is me. The solution is you. The solution is everybody. We can do so much better than we're doing. And that's by finding somewhere in your landscape to do native landscaping. Uh, it's difficult, you know, because so many people live in apartment situations, they live in condominium associations, and uh, that, that you know, it's, it's, it makes it difficult. There are obstacles there. But for those of us who can, those of us who own our own homes, um, we can definitely contribute to this. And certainly our municipalities can do so uh, in their vast expanses of turf. Uh, and we at Root Pike Watershed Initiative Network are working very hard uh, with municipalities to do that. So we have lots of projects going on, both large and small scale products, uh, projects that are converting um, what is essentially useless turf grass into something vibrant and life-giving. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, this is one of our native plants. Um, this is our native woodland phlox. You can see that it has five petals. Our native phlox has five petals. Uh, just a few weeks ago, there were flowers that looked like this that were blooming, but those are not it. Those are a highly invasive, aggressive species called Dame's Rocket. Um, and so we work really hard to get rid of that and reintroduce um, our, our native uh, flowering species. So pollinator patches, <laughs> if you plant them, they will come. We have firsthand evidence of that. And now we have firsthand evidence of it as of about 48 hours ago, uh, the firm that we're working with on the 210 acre restoration got an up close and personal picture of a rusty patched bumblebee. This is a rusty patched bumblebee. Um, you have no idea how much time we spend out in the field trying to get pictures of bees. <laughs> it's really difficult. Uh, but uh, once we started to remove all the non-native stuff that's there, and we started just this past winter, all of that non-native and um, aggressive, invasive plant species that were suppressing the native seed stock in the soil that um, started to uh, regenerate. Um, and so this plant is called uh, a lot of different things. Common names for plants don't really mean anything, but this is called uh, bee balm. Uh, this is Monarda fistulosa, um, and it is beloved by rusty patched bumblebees. Um, so before the landscape in and around UW Parkside was transformed into, you know, 99% non-natives, uh, this plant was uh, robust and abundant, and that's why the rusty patched bumblebee was robust and abundant. And as soon as its food sources began to decline, so too did the rusty pet bumblebee. Uh, you have no idea how excited we are to have confirmed documented evidence of a rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, we don't know if this is a worker or a drone because we can't see the rest of its body that's tucked in, uh, but we have confirmation from the US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service um, as well as the DNR that yes, indeed, this is a rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, so yay, yay. <laughs> um, a lot of people have very small lots and they, they don't think that they can manage doing a native landscaping. So if you think you can't, uh, there is one thing that you can do that's enormously, enormously meaningful and purposeful. And that is to plant an oak tree. Any of our native oak trees, whatever the one species that are appropriate for your area and your soil, our native oak trees support somewhere around 570 different species of native butterflies and moths. Uh, that means they accidentally pick up pollen when they're nectaring on our native plants um, and doing wonderful pollination. Uh, it also means, of course, that our native bird species have adequate protein to feed their babies because even hummingbird babies uh, eat primarily insects that their parents bring back. The babies don't survive on nectar 
um, until they mature and start flying about and begin nectaring on our native plants. So if you want birds, you need insects. If you want birds, native birds now I'm talking about, I don't care about non-native birds, but if you want native birds, they need a place to hide from predators. They need a place to rest. They need a place to get out of the heat. Um, and, uh, the, and of course, many of our native bird species need dead trees because uh, they can make holes in there. We have a lot of cavity nesters. Um, and unfortunately, what we tend to do in our society is take down all the dead trees in a forest or in a landscape. And uh, what people don't realize is, is that the dead trees, the standing dead trees are just as important as the living trees. Um, and, and also, just to harken back to my first slide, acorns are actually edible by humans. You have to do a lot of processing to make them taste good. Um, but uh, First Nations people here in Wisconsin would have ground them up for flour after they were processed. Uh, so yeah, you can eat acorns, it's true. They're not just for the squirrels, but they are good for the squirrels. Um, here's another fabulous plant that I always encourage people to to put in their gardens, especially if you have a nice sunny area. This is one of our milkweed species. Um, this is called, some people call it orange milkweed, some people call it butterfly milkweed, um, Asclepius tuberosa. Such amazing color, such amazing seed production, really excellent for pollinators, and just a, a wonderful, beautiful thing to look at as well. So, so just to quickly summarize, um, we, we have a lot of um, non-life-giving landscapes at this point. Um, and for a while, we had the luxury to do that, but we, we don't have that luxury anymore. Um, we can have beautiful, stunning, life-giving, purposeful landscapes. Um, simply by incorporating natives uh, back into our front yards, our side yards, our backyards, our school grounds. Uh, and that's what we want to do with the Pollinator Patch Program. We want to get businesses and schools and other organizations uh, on board to put in uh, pollinator patches uh, so that we can uh, conserve soil, we can conserve water, uh, and we can support, support um, all of the other living things that we must do at this point. They are resilient landscapes. Uh, and, and that's where it's at now, folks, resilient landscapes. So um, if you have questions, I would love to answer questions. Um, if you don't have questions, that's OK, too. Um, whatever you'd like is fine with me. Hi, Nan. Thank you very much. That was, a, that was really fascinating, actually. Um, my, Judy and I have been working on trying to restore some of our property here. here let, let me put this back on video so you can see what we look like. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and um, they, we have a couple pollinator patches going, and it's really fascinating what happens. We moved here from south of Kansas City. What? Oh. Anyway. Uh, started native playing there. But the big thing for us is clearing land and preparing it. We mm -hmm. have just a little under two acres here. And beside the fact that I'm too lazy to mow, <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to put a lot of uh, more, expand a little lot more. Right. So, so getting the clearing done <clears throat> and then where to get the plants. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, two things. Um, what are you doing? How did you clear it for your pollinator patch? Well, for our small patches, we I, I mowed it down to the nub and then essentially scraped out the surface because I don't really know what's there. A lot of it's, you know, just overfill from where the house foundation was. Yeah. Done. yeah. Um, uh, took it down about three, four inches and filled it in with composted soil from you somebody up it. the road. Yeah, yeah, I did till it as far as I could. Now, those pollinator patches are doing pretty well, most of them. Oh, good. Um, but as far as, I, I tried seeding some grandma grass and nothing uh -huh. came up. I lost, the the straw that I used for overburden did give me a nice wheat crop, though. Yeah, so I'm sure it did. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, okay. we, we, have, we have Creeping Charlie, 
we have uh, snakeberry, and they're a problem. And I don't know how to get rid of them other than to burn them out. And I can't really do that here unless I do. Um, you know, how, how big is your pollinator patch? Uh, what, like 20, 25 by, we have a couple. We actually have three of them. The have, one back here is probably 25 by no. No, 15 by 10 yeah. is one of them. Uh, and then we have another one that's about the same size. The one across the front of the house is long and thin. Like that's three. mostly grandma grass, three feet deep. Mm -hmm. It's on a hillside. And then we have a hillside that's all wheat. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, we have a shady spot where we have a lot of bee balm and cardinal flowers and stuff trying to grow. But the biggest issue for us is in that in the areas where there's creeping Charlie, it is almost impossible to keep that stuff out. And I don't know how to kill it you know, without killing all the other Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the most effective way to manage non-native invasive species in a native planting is actually to burn it. And okay. um, I'm sure when you were prepping the areas and planting it, it seemed like you were doing acres and acres of land. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in um, realistically, those are those are fairly easily manageable patches, and you don't you don't have to burn all of them at the same time, mm -hmm. and you don't have to burn the entirety of each one at the same time. So when we do prescribe burns, we don't do the whole area at once. We leave um, areas for things to escape into um, because you don't. You know, you don't want to take all of the habitat away for the things right. that now you've attracted. So you could easily divide all of your patches in half. And then what you would do is either weed whack it or burn or, or chop it down, let it go brown and dry. Um, and you're just looking for little tiny flames that, you know, you don't want a conflagration, just right. little flames. Um, and, and then what you want to see is nice black ground. Um, a lot of weed seeds don't tolerate the heat um, and a lot of weedy plants don't tolerate it either. Um, and then as things are coming back, you need to watch it like a hawk um, to make certain you get rid of the stuff that you don't want. Okay. You know, fortunately, Creeping Charlie is really easy to pull out, yeah, um, yeah. especially when the ground is a little bit softer and moister than it is now. Um, so th that's a pretty effective way of doing it. The other thing you could do too is start putting in some plant plugs for diversity or, or the other option is when you burn those off, overseed them with a very diverse mix of native plants. Um, and I can send you lists of plants um, that our pollinators love if you would like me to. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you you can always start over if you want to. Uh, there's no harm in that. You know, we all have to learn some way. Um, but again, and, and you know, that's an example of how um, if you prep something thoroughly, you don't have the problems that you're having now. Um, but it can be fixed. It's called remediation. Right. Lots of people go through this. So I think I think the patches are doing okay. It's that they were relatively easy to manage. They were very small, right. but but is but everything around them, I mean, large swaths. That... We want to transform more of our yard into native plants. And that's mm -hmm. that's where you get sick because there's a lot of creeping Charlie. I and mean, we probably have about an acre of land that we want to transform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've been chopping out buckthorn like mad. And are you treating the buckthorn? Pardon me? Are you treating the buckthorn with you an herbicide? The, you mean the, the roots and everything? No, when we just cut been cutting it down. Okay, it has to be both. Oh. Um, it has to be both. So you have to cut and treat. Um, so you know what I should do is I should, I should write something up for you. But so when we take buckthorn out, there's a couple of things we do. Okay. Um, okay. So for females, the most effective thing to do is to girdle the trunk. So if it's a sizable trunk, girdle it. And I can send you a really cool video about how to girdle. Okay. okay. The guy is not girdling buckthorn. He's girdling a different invasive tree species, but okay. the process is the same. It's exactly okay. the same. And it's, he, it's perfect. Um, 
he doesn't use any herbicide. And that's, that's absolutely effective because when you girdle something properly, it interrupts the circulatory system of the plant. So it can no longer do what it needs to do. And eventually it dies off. Hmm. So if, but if you treat the girdled part with an herbicide, it dies off more quickly. Okay. What we do with female buckthorns, the berry producing buckthorns, um, I prefer to girdle them, treat it with an herbicide, but leave them right there where they are. Because if you cut them down and drag them elsewhere, you're just dragging a line of berries and replanting them as you go. Oh. So, so you're working against yourself, essentially, is what I'm saying. Um, the males you can cut down and get rid of. The beauty of, is, of killing them in place, whether they're males or females, um, is that when you're reestablishing native shrubs and trees, um, you still have a little bit of a screen because you have those trunks mm -hmm. while the native ones are coming up. Okay. Um, so now buckthorn will always try to come back and spite you because that's what it does. Um, and so you just have to watch for re-sprouts and cut and treat those. So if, um, you, if you put an herbicide, does it, do you, I mean, I, I understand they have like a xenopathic compound that comes out of their root system, right? Yeah. So, so that stop that? Yes. So uh, what a lot of people will do is they'll run around their woodland and they'll pull out the, the little ones because they're easy to pull out. It's like, yeah, I got rid of it. Um, but that sends a chemical message down that root system and it activates the nodes to re-sprout elsewhere. So pulling buckthorn, unless you can get, I mean, like 99.9% .9 of the root system out there, again, it's like just replanting the berries from the female. Okay. Um, you can also, I mean, if you have little ones, if, you know, you can mow them down, but you have to treat them. So okay. it has to be mechanical and chemical together. Otherwise it just re-sprouts. And you'll, you have a, you have a, an, an uh, advice for what chemicals to use. I mean, I'm a chemist, so if you oh, cool. how long we can find it. Uh, you know, we, we just use Roundup. Oh, just, okay. Yeah. And then what we do is mix it with something called, I mean, there are all the different kinds of products. The one that's easily available is something called Signal. And it's just a blue dye that you mix uh, with the Roundup. And that way, you know where you've actually painted it. You know, you don't keep painting the same one over and over again. Because <laughs> that happens when you have lots of them. I don't know, did I get this one? Mm. Um, uh, food coloring just doesn't work because it's just not strong enough. It doesn't leave much of a color. Um, so you can order that online, or um, if you're close to, um, so I live close to something called um, Conserve FS that, you know, farmers use it. So mm -hmm. they have all those kinds of things, but you can order Signal online too. Okay. okay. Or, or any other color, it doesn't have to be Signal, but you know, whatever. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to say, too, that Wisconsin is really, really lucky, uh, simply because we have so many native plant propagating businesses in Wisconsin. Other states just don't have that. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have, um, we don't have one like in Milwaukee County. I mean, you can go to Johnson's Nursery and they have a lot of natives, but they'll also try to sell you something called Native R's and other natives that they've played around with a little bit. And you want to avoid those. You want straight up natives. Yeah, because I mean, we have some, we, we do a lot of coneflowers, but some are hybrids that we keep out front, but you know, they yeah. start wildfire too. Right, and so unfortunately the hybrids don't, they tend not to last as long. Um, and so our native coneflower is Echinacea pallida or pale purple coneflower. Yeah. Purple coneflower actually isn't native to Wisconsin. Um, but it's been, you know, so many nurseries sell it and they label it as a native plant. It is native to the Midwest. It just doesn't have to be native here. Right. Um, it's native south of us. Um, but I can send you a whole list of places uh, oh, from which to pick. Um, they're great. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And most of them, you know, 
deliver because of COVID now. Um, mm. So yeah. And usually towards the end of the season, they have sales, <laughs> which is really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and there are places where you buy plants, you can buy seeds, you can buy a combo. Um, so you have lots of resources. Okay. Okay. So if we, we, we have your email from your slide. And, yes. Uh, send that yeah, just you. email me and then I can get those um, resources to you. Okay. Perfect. Um, Nia, if you could send me some of those resources so that I could also put that um, up with the YouTube video. Yes. That would mm -hmm. be really awesome as sure, well. I'd love to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, this was a, uh, a jewel of a find. On the, on the <laughs> well, that was a nice thing to say. Yeah, <laughs> That's cool. Uh, Your house looks cool. beautiful. I love the exposed beams. That's really oh, cool. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I, again, we thank you so much for your time. Oh, sure. sure. We'll be out sweating and making sure everything grows, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to let you know, um, in August, we're starting a series of training sessions. Um, uh, one, because we need a cadre of um, well-informed volunteers to help us in our project sites uh, do lots of different things. And also, we, I just really would like to create an environmentally literate uh, populace in any way that I can. Um, so um, if you go to our Facebook page, the Hike Wind Facebook page, um, we'll be posting those classes okay. online. And we're doing a whole bunch of them. We're going to do, the first one is going to be Botany 101, so people can learn how to identify plants. How we're gonna do it. <laughs> I need that. It's been a long time since I had uh, and then we're actually gonna do plant ID where we go out in the field, not the same night, but there's a whole host of things that we're gonna do. So um okay. so oh, spread the word. Okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. We will. Great, cool. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Oh, welcome. Thank it was my pleasure. So much for coming. I look forward well, to hearing from soon. you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.